Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the three to five player game Adrenaline, designed by Philippe Naduck and published by Czech Games Edition. Here, you'll be trapped with other combatants in a futuristic arena. Draw first blood or go for the kill shot, all's fair in this first person shooter style game of gladiatorial combat. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, you'll need to build the play area with these two double-sided boards. The different ways you can put them together provides you with different layout configurations, and the rules provide suggestions based on the number of players. We're going to set up for a four-player game in this video, and we'll use this layout. On this kill shot track, place five to eight of these plastic skulls. This allows you to adjust the length of the game. A normal length would be eight skulls, but for your first game, they recommend placing only five. These are the power-up and weapon cards. Shuffle them each into their own face-down decks. And from the weapon deck, draw one into each of these nine spaces that you'll find on the outside edge of the board. These are the ammo tiles, which should be mixed up and placed face-down nearby. Now deal one face-up onto all spaces with these symbols. Be sure not to confuse these with the two symbols side-by-side -side that look like this in some squares of the board. When you're finished, it should look something like this, and these point tokens should also be placed within reach of the players. Each player now collects one of the double-sided player boards and matching action tiles, placing them with these sides face up and pushing them together. They then take the character figure and damage tokens in their color, along with three of each of the different colored ammo cubes. One of each of these is then placed into this area of their player board known as the ammo box. Now choose a starting player to give this starting player marker. This double-sided board and bot card are used in other modes of play, which we'll talk about later. So these you can return to the box. And that's the setup. In Adrenaline, players will be collecting new weapons along with the resources necessary to fire and reload them in order to do damage to as many opponents as possible, all the while avoiding taking damage yourself. The game starts with the first player, and then turns are taken in clockwise order around and around the table. On your first turn of the game, draw and privately examine two of these power-up cards, choosing one to keep and revealing the other. The color shown here represents the spawn space that you'll enter the game in. These spaces are indicated by the combined symbols like we see here. So there's one for each of the three colors, yellow, blue, and red. Since I revealed this blue power-up, I'll place my figure into the blue spawn space. Now the card is placed into a shared discard pile beside the board. These power-ups have other uses, but we'll discuss those later. As soon as you perform the steps to bring your figure onto the board, you'll then immediately perform the steps that make up a normal turn. These are the steps that you'll follow for the rest of the game every time it becomes your turn at the table. So let's go back to the table right now and see how these work. On your turn, as shown here, you'll take up to two actions in any order, repeating an action if you want. And these are represented by the symbols here for running around, grabbing stuff, and shooting. Let's begin by learning the action for running around, which allows you to move your figure up to three spaces. First, let's look at the board, which is made up of several square-shaped spaces. A move is always from one space to an adjacent one, but never diagonally or through walls, which are these thick bordered areas between the various rooms. That said, a figure can move through doors, which have these arrows on either side of them. And it should be noted that these ammo boxes or other figures don't stop your figure from moving through spaces. Another action is to grab stuff. Yep, that's its in-game term, grab stuff. This first arrow means that you may move one space first and then grab, but you can also just stay put and grab from the space you're in. However, you cannot use this action to grab and then afterwards move that one space. If you're on a space with an ammo token, then you can grab it by moving the indicated cubes from your personal supply into your ammo box. So in this case, we would gain two blue cubes and one yellow. You then discard this token to a common discard area. Keep in mind though, you can never gain more ammo than what's left in your personal supply. So for example, if I later grabbed this ammo token, I would gain one red cube and only one yellow cube. The other one would have to be ignored. 
If the token you're grabbing shows this symbol, then in addition to any cubes you gain, you also draw the top card of the power-up deck and secretly add it to your hand. At most, you can have three power-ups at any time, so ignore any of these symbols that would cause you to draw a fourth one. If you use the grab action while in one of these spawn spaces, you won't find an ammo token there, but instead you can take any one of the weapon cards found by that location after you pay its cost, which is shown here in the upper left-hand corner. You make this payment by moving the matching colored cubes from your ammo box back into your personal supply. But if you can't pay the cost, you can't take the weapon. That said, when buying a weapon, you actually ignore the top colored cube. So this machine gun would actually only cost one red cube, whereas this flamethrower wouldn't cost anything at all. We'll learn about the purpose of that top cube a little bit later. Once paid for, you take the card into your hand, and while it's there, it's considered to be loaded and ready to fire. That said, at most you can have three weapons at a time. If you would take a fourth, then you need to drop any one of your other weapons, fired or unfired, into the slot that you just purchased from. This can now be grabbed by any player taking the grab action in the future. The final action we have to go over is the crosshair symbol that you'll find on your action tile. This represents shooting. To shoot, you'll need to have a loaded weapon, which again is represented by the weapons that you have in your hand. As long as you have a valid target, you can fire by playing that weapon face up in front of you, and then potentially paying additional costs that might allow you to boost the weapon's effect. Once the weapon is placed face up in front of you, it's considered fired and unloaded. All the weapons in the game are unique, and we won't go over each one, but there is a handy guide included that you can look at to understand how the different weapons work if you have any questions. That said, let's go over two of the weapons as an example, and to help with this, I've placed two other figures on the board. This is the Electro Scythe, and even though it's more of a melee weapon, we still use this during the shooting action. If a weapon's effect has a solid line dividing an upper and lower half, then we choose only one of these effects to resolve when we play this weapon from our hand. For example, we could do the upper half, which will deal one damage to all enemies within our space, so in this case, the yellow and green player would take one damage each. Or when playing the Electro Scythe, we could instead pay a blue and red cube to resolve the bottom half, which would do two damage to each enemy in our space. When you do damage to an opponent, you give them the appropriate number of damage markers from your personal supply, and they add them to the damage track here from left to right, starting on this space. Let's say the blue player was instead firing a weapon like this machine gun. It has one main effect shown here, allowing you to choose up to two different targets that you can see and do one damage to each of them. You may then do either or both of these options in any order, assuming that you can pay their costs. So we could pay a yellow cube to do one more damage to one of the previous targets, and or we could pay one blue cube to do an additional damage to the other target, and or pick a third target and do one damage to them instead. Again, I generally recommend that you refer to this weapon guide at least the first time you fire each weapon, just to ensure that you're interpreting the icons correctly. But now we need to move on and learn a very important concept, and that is how you determine which spaces your figure can see when it's trying to target an enemy. We know that the board is made up of several separate spaces. However, spaces sharing the same color are known as a room, and a figure can always see all the other figures within its same room. So the two combatants here can clearly see each other. Also, if your figure is on a space with a door, it can see all figures on any spaces of the room that's on the other side of that door. To help clarify, I like to explain it this way. While in a space, you have to imagine that the figure has the ability to move all around within it, meaning that they can peek their head through a door and then see all the areas of this entire room. So again, from here, the blue player can peek out and see this yellow player, even if they're kind of tucked over in this corner. That said, the figure in this space will not be able to see the figure in this square because they aren't by the door. We can imagine that this target is sort of tucked safely over in this corner, and there's no way for this player to see them from here. If instead the yellow player was in this space, then yes, they could also peek through the door and examine this entire room. And for the sake of one more example, the purple player here can peek through this door and target all of the figures in this space, 
But neither of these figures can target the purple player because they are not adjacent to this room's door. It should be noted that figures cannot see through walls, and figures don't block each other. So the green player here could target the purple player here. As you get shot, your damage track will fill up with different colored damage markers, which can unlock better actions. For example, as soon as your damage is at least this high, now you'll be able to move up to two spaces on your turn and then grab. And once you have damage up to here, you'll be able to move one space and then shoot. Now you don't have to use these enhanced actions, but you can, and like the normal actions on your turn, you can do the same one twice. Some weapons or power-ups may allow you to mark other players, which is represented by these symbols. As an example, let's say the yellow player was targeted by the green player who's firing this weapon using the top effect. First, this deals one point of damage, and then two marks. Marks you receive are placed in this upper area of your board. The next time you do damage to a player who has your marks, after the new damage is placed, all your matching colored marks are also moved down to the damage track. So let's say on a later turn, the green player once again fired this weapon at the yellow player. They would again add one point of damage. The two marks that were here previously would move down, and now two more marks would be added to this area. Keep in mind, at most, you may have three marks from each player at any one time. Any extras you would receive beyond that can simply be ignored. As soon as you cause a player to take damage on this 11th space of their track, they've taken a kill shot and their figure is tipped over. Now, they can still be targeted during your turn, meaning that you might be able to do a 12th point of damage, which is also known as overkill. But either way, at the end of your turn, their figure will be scored. In this case, when we caused this point of damage, we had some marks here, so these would slide down. And the extra damage that would be owed after this 12th point are simply ignored and returned to that player's supply. At the end of your turn, before resolving any kills, you have the option to reload any number of your weapons. This is represented by the symbol found here. To reload, you pay the full cost of the weapons face up in front of you, which adds them back into your hand, making them available for firing on your next turn. So to reload the machine gun, we'd need to pay one blue and one red cube. Keep in mind that you can only reload at the end of your turn. So if you don't reload a weapon now, it will not be available on your next turn. So here we have a choice to make. I can either reload the machine gun or the electroscythe, but not both. Well, I'm planning to bash some heads next turn, so I'll take back into my hand the electroscythe. After reloading, you'll now score all player boards that received at least a kill shot during your turn. So in this case, we'd score green. The player who shot that board first will get a point, as shown here, for first blood. All points gained are claimed from these piles and then placed face down near the scoring player's board. If you ever need to, you can always make change from these piles as necessary. Now the player who put the most total damage on the defeated player's damage track gains eight points, second most gains six, third most four, and so on. In this case, blue put a total of five damage, and so did yellow. Whenever there's a tie, it's broken in favor of the tied player who has any one of their markers closer to the front of the damage track. In this case, that would be blue, so they'll claim the eight points, putting them face down here. This means yellow gets six points, and purple will gain four. Keep in mind, if none of your damage markers are found on a defeated player's damage track, then you won't score any points. And tokens you have in this top area don't count. Once these points have been scored, take the damage token from the kill shot space here and put it in place of the leftmost skull token on the kill shot track. If there's overkill damage on this 12th space, it's stacked on top of that token. And the player who is overkilled now places one of their damage tokens on the player who overkilled them as a marker representing their desire for revenge. The skull you removed from the kill shot track is now placed on the leftmost open pentagon space of the dead player. From now on, when they're killed in the future, only the values from six and lower will be awarded for most kills, second most kills, and so on. If they're defeated again, you'll cover up the six space, continuing like that, which means killing the same player over and over again becomes less valuable. I should also mention that if a player deals a kill shot to more than one player in a single turn, they gain one extra point, as shown here. 
After a dead player has been scored, all damage tokens on them are returned to the appropriate players, while any marks they might have had remain in place. They also keep any weapons they had and ammo. Now the defeated player draws a new power-up card even if they are already at their maximum of three in their hand, and amongst all that they have, they choose one to discard, spawning into that colored space. So in this case, the green player would go here. At the end of a player's turn, you'll now replace any taken ammo crates and weapons by drawing them from the appropriate piles. Keep in mind, at most a player could only grab two items during their turn, but I'm having to replace more because I've been kind of breaking the rules as I've been showing you different examples. If the ammo tokens ever run out, shuffle the discarded ones into a new draw pile. But once weapons run out, no new ones will be drawn for the rest of the game. And that ends the player's turn, and then the next player in clockwise order would go. Keeping in mind, if we had actually just finished the first player's turn, then none of these figures would yet be on the board. So the next player to go would actually have to draw two power cards, as we saw earlier in this video, to determine their initial spawn point, and then they would take their turn as normal. But now, let's go over the other uses for power cards. At the point you're paying a cost, you may discard power-up cards as the shown cubes to replace a cost you would normally have to pay. For example, if I wanted to grab this railgun, remember we ignore the top cube, but I'd still have to pay a yellow and a blue one. I only have a blue one here, but I could spend this and discard this power-up as a yellow card and be able to claim this weapon. Keep in mind, you cannot discard a power-up to simply gain a cube to your ammo crate. You may only use these to cover a cost as you're paying it. Another use for these is to discard them for the pictured effect. And you can discard as many as you like at any one time when the effect applies. And there are four different types. Let's take a look at each one. The targeting scope lets you pay a cube of any color when you deal damage to one or more targets. After paying that cube, you may then deal one more point of damage to one of those targets. However, you cannot use this ability if you're only dealing marks. You may play the Newton effect on your turn before or after any action in order to choose another player's figure, even one you can't see, and move it one or two spaces in a straight direction. The tag back grenade can be played when you take damage from an enemy that you can see. This allows you to then place a mark on them. Finally, we have the teleporter, which you can play on your turn before or after any action to move your figure to any space. So we've gone over all the things that you can do on your turn, and for your first game, they recommend that you end it as soon as the last skull is taken from the board, advancing you to final scoring. However, for future games, you may wish to enact Final Frenzy. This happens at the end of the turn when the last skull was taken, and it can help balance out the final scores. Also, keep in mind, if you would ever get more kill shots than there are skulls to collect on the kill track, you still put all related kill and overkill tokens on this space, and they'll count towards final scoring at the end of the game. Once Final Frenzy is triggered, all players with no damage, including those that were just scored, will flip their boards over, keeping their marks and ammo, but removing any skulls that they had. You can see that killing these players will no longer award you points for first blood, and not very high points for defeating them. Now all players flip over their action tiles and continue playing with each player performing one more turn, including the player that triggered Final Frenzy. And in this case, let's say that was the purple player. That means the green player will go next, and if you're taking your final turn before the player who started the game, that is, before the player who has this marker in front of them, then you'll get to take two actions. These must come from this upper area of your flipped over action tile. These symbols should all be familiar to you, but as a quick reminder, this one in the center of the top one represents reloading. So you can actually move, reload, and then shoot. If you're the starting player or your final turn occurs after the starting players, you may only take a single action from these two at the bottom. Any boards that are killed during final frenzy are scored as usual and then flipped over to their other side, with kill and overkill tokens going to the kill shot track as normal. After the final turn, you now score all boards that still have damage tokens on them, just as you normally would, even though those players aren't dead. But obviously, no kill or overkill points will be awarded to the kill shot track. 
Now score the kill shot track following the same method as scoring a dead player using these values here and breaking ties towards this side of the track. Then have players reveal all of their scoring tokens, adding them up, and the player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, break it in favor of the player who got the higher score on the kill shot track. If the tied players did not have markers on the kill shot track, they instead remain tied and share the victory. And that's everything you need to know to play Adrenaline, although there are two other modes of play that you can try as well. Domination uses this track and has players trying to control the three spawn points, while turret mode has players trying to control turrets that they can also use to shoot the other players. There are also rules for adding a bot to the game if you want additional targets in lower play count games, like with three and sometimes even four players. But these additional modes I'll leave for you to discover on your own. If you have any questions about anything that you saw here, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.